Hey everybody, I'm Ryan with Perfect Circuit, and today we're going to talk about one of the most influential designs in the history of synthesizers and electronic music altogether, the Moog Modular System. In particular, I'd like to focus on its filters, which in many ways define our collective impression of what a synthesizer should sound like altogether. But first, let's talk a little bit about Moog history and about the system behind us, the Model 12. If you're even vaguely familiar with the history of electronic music, you most likely already know about Moog. Robert Moog was one of the first commercial synthesizer manufacturers, developing his first synthesizer systems in the mid-1960s. With the help of close collaborators and the influence of designers like Harold Boda and Raymond Scott, Moog created an instrument that gave musicians unprecedented control over all aspects of sound, timbre, pitch, rhythm, and so on and gave them the ability to manipulate these in real time in a countless number of ways. This was a tremendous contrast to other workflows in electronic music at the time, which most commonly relied on the use of appropriated electronic test equipment, recorded sounds, and tape manipulation, which typically led to a process with only limited real-time control and little opportunity for musical performance in a traditional sense. By taking inspiration from the use of test equipment, which often employed oscillators, filters, amplifiers, and the like, and through his own familiarity with musical electronics in the form of the theremin, Moog was able to devise a system in which multiple devices could be housed in a single chassis and interconnected with patch cables to influence one another's behavior in a variety of ways, and even to change the way those behaviors worked over time. That is to say, Moog systems are modular, uh, comprised of individual distinct devices that come together through synthesis to create a more meaningful whole. By patching these modules together, you create an audio signal path and a control path that allows you to change how sound behaves over time through control voltage. So Moog's instruments quickly gained popularity because of their use by gifted musicians like Wendy Carlos, Keith Emerson, and Bernie Krauss, just to name a few to the point that the name Moog became synonymous for many with the term synthesizer altogether. And many of Moog's synthesizer concepts became a de facto standard that other manufacturers look to when developing their own instruments, to the point that today, uh, the influence of Moog designs is still apparent in practically every commercially available synthesizer altogether. And if imitation is a form of flattery, then maybe the most flattering part of the Moog system is the transistor ladder low-pass filter, which has literally been copied uh, by countless other designers, literally from the point it was released on to the current day. This filter is a huge contributing factor to the character of the Moog modular system altogether, and filters generally are now the core of what we tend to call subtractive synthesis, which is a type of synthesis in which we start with harmonically rich waveforms like saw waves or pulse waves and remove harmonic content in order to make more nuanced and interesting sounds. So the Moog system that we have here is a modified version of the Model 12 one of Moog's early small systems, which was produced contemporaneously with the larger studio systems and the smaller self-contained mini Moog. Now, despite the fact that this synth is modular and can be configured to act in a pretty wide number of roles, this system really, in a lot of ways, is still like a prototypical monosynth and contains a lot of the same types of things that you'd expect to see in a modern keyboard monosynth. So let's take a quick look at what this system contains to have a better sense of how things work all together. In the name of brevity, we're not gonna look in depth at every single feature, but better understanding what all's here will help us focus on the filters here in a few minutes. So this system contains three oscillators, a 921 and two 921Bs. These each have outputs for their individual wave shapes, and they have inputs for sync, frequency, modulation, and all of their other controls. Now, each oscillator has its own fine frequency control and octave range selection switch. The 921 functions more or less the way that we typically think a modern oscillator should work, but the 921Bs are a little bit different. In the Moog ecosystem, Groups of 921B oscillators are always paired with a 921A oscillator driver module, 
which provides a master pitch control and pulse width control for all of the attached 921Bs. So these are connected behind the panel in such a way that the 921A's frequency and pulse width knobs and CV inputs affect both of the connected 921B oscillators. This keeps the oscillators tracking together and makes the common technique of using multiple stacked oscillators for a single synth voice logistically a lot simpler to execute. The 921 uh, is independent of these. And while it's certainly more than capable as an audio oscillator and sounds great, in the context of a system like this, it's commonly used as an LFO to provide cyclical modulation to other parameters throughout the synth. We'll explore that more in a bit as we start uh, diving into some patches. The system also contains a 902 VCA, which you usually use at the end of the signal chain in order to control the, the overall loudness of your sound and two 911 envelope generators, which are the original ADSR envelopes, despite not being labeled as such. It also contains a dual multiple module, which allows you to split signals to go to multiple destinations at a single time. The bottom of this system is the Moog Model 12 control panel, which is um, a single faceplate with several sub-modules behind it. This includes utility modules that can be used for a handful of different functions. Perhaps most importantly, it contains the interface jacks for external controllers. So if you had a keyboard or ribbon controller, this would produce the uh, S-trig signals and control voltages from those so that you can interact with the system in performance. It also features a reversible attenuator, which these days is commonly referred to as an attenuverter or an inverting attenuator and contains this very special module, the CP3 mixer. A uh, mixer may not seem terribly exciting right off the bat, but this particular one provides some really pleasant harmonic distortion whenever it's driven, and in a lot of ways is responsible for the characteristic sound of Moog synthesizers. So despite not looking like much uh, at a glance, it's actually a very important piece of the puzzle that is this entire system. And the top row of this system contains the 903 random signal generator, which produces both white and pink noise. The majority of the system's filtering capabilities in the form of the 904A low pass filter, the 904B high pass filter, and the 904C filter coupler. Now, this particular instrument is a bit different than the standard Model 12 because at the request of the original owner, Moog expanded its filtering section. So while a typical Model 12 would have only the 904A low pass filter and the 907 fixed filter bank, this one also contains the 904B and 904C filter coupler up here, as we've discussed. And that has physically displaced the 907, but it still works just as well, whether or not it's actually in the main cabinet with everything else. Anyway, now that we've taken a look at what this system contains, let's start taking a closer look at all of its filtering capabilities, starting by looking at the 904A transistor ladder low pass filter. So the 904A is perhaps the most famous of Moog's designs. Uh, it's the original transistor ladder filter and the only design from the modular system for which Moog acquired a patent. It provides a 24 decibel per octave cutoff slope, and while it looks simple from the panel, it adds a huge amount of character to anything that passes through it. So the panel controls are relatively simple. This fixed control voltage knob acts as a filter cutoff frequency control, and the regeneration knob uh, controls what we now usually call filter resonance, or Q. The frequency range control offsets the cutoff frequency by two octave steps. So when set all the way left to position one, the cutoff range is roughly one hertz to five kilohertz. In setting two, the range is roughly four hertz to 20 kilohertz. And in setting three, the range is roughly 16 hertz to 80 kilohertz, which is well above the range of human hearing. So in many musical applications, people stick with range two, uh, due to the fact that it neatly covers the range of human pitch perception. But if you're looking for darker or brighter sounds, ranges one and three are still perfectly musically useful. So just to get a sense of how things sound, let's start simple. 
So I'm just running a saw wave through the filter straight to the amplifier to the output. So I'm just gonna adjust some settings and then I'll start a sequence to control the oscillator pitch so that we can hear, hear how it sounds in a slightly more musical context. Now we don't have a vintage Moog sequencer here, sadly, so I'm using a modern Behringer clone of the 960 sequencer. Um, it honestly works super well, and for the purposes of this demonstration, it's gonna do just fine. So yeah, let's, let's take a listen to what this sounds like uh, with, with some different settings. So this already sounds pretty incredible. Uh, with no resonance added, the filter really darkens the sound and adds a lot of this kind of low-end oomph to it. Uh, and once you start adding resonance, uh, it starts to pick out all these different overtones in this really beautiful and musical way. Of course, in this system, we seldom just run a single oscillator through the filter. One of the really nice things is that we have a lot of oscillators. So let's try a different example where we combine both of the 921Bs and the 921 through the CP3 mixer in order to hear what a big oscillator stack sounds like running through this filter. Okay, so this patch looks a bit more complicated, uh, but honestly, it's still pretty simple. So basically what we're doing is running our sequence into the multiple module, splitting that so it goes both to the 921A and to the 921. Then I'm just taking a sawtooth output from each of the oscillators and running all of them into the CP3 and then running the CP3 into the 904A so that we hear a mix of all of the oscillators together. Now, this patch, again, it takes advantage of one of the, the really important parts of this system, which is the CP3 itself. Uh, this mixer, whenever you get past noon on most of the controls, starts to add this kind of funky harmonic distortion. And the net effect is that it makes sine waves and triangle waves much uh, beefier, for lack of better words, and adds this extra kind of high-end fizz to saw waves. And you'll hear in a moment that it, it really adds just a huge amount of body to the sound. Now, I've tuned our 921Bs to be a fifth apart from one another, so we get a kind of classic stacked oscillator sound. And yeah, let's let's hear what it sounds like through through the 904A.
Whoa. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so that patch sounded a absolutely huge. So one of the things that you're hearing there, or that you should hear there, is that the sum of all of these oscillators, when they're very slightly detuned from one another, creates all of these like kind of cascading movements within the sound. Uh, even when we're not really modulating anything, we're not modulating the oscillators, we're not modulating the filter, you can hear this almost like rolling characteristic uh, to, that, to that drone. Another thing that you should also have noticed is that depending on the setting of the resonance or regeneration control, the low end of the sound changes a huge amount. Um, and that's intrinsic to the design of this filter and the various clones that exist out there. So as soon as you start adding resonance, the low end really drops a lot. So you get this much more kind of wet, liquidy sort of sound, um, but you really lose a lot of the, the power that it can provide in the low end. Now, uh, I know what you're thinking. It'd be really nice if we could add some sort of inflection or articulation to the sound. And of course, as with, with any good synthesizer, uh, that's where envelopes come into play. So let's set up a patch similar to this one uh, that uses the envelopes to good effect. So in this system, in order to create a sense of inflection and, and kind of contour to your sounds, you typically use one of the 911 envelope generators in conjunction with the low pass filter. So you may have noticed that the low pass filter has three control inputs on the bottom, and these all affect the cutoff frequency. So you can use this to effectively sum multiple control voltages to all impact the filter at once. Uh, at first, we're just going to use uh, an envelope generator that's synchronized to our sequencer so that we can kind of hear what it's like to perform this frequency sweeping uh, using an external control source. So it's worth noting that I've changed up this patch a little bit. Uh, we're no longer listening to all three oscillators. We're only listening to the 921Bs. And I've patched from both of their rectangular outputs. And I've set this 921 to be in a much lower frequency range. So rather than using it as an audio source, I'm instead using it as a pulse width modulation control source. So basically just using it like a normal sine wave LFO going into the pulse width control on the 921A. And you'll hear what that sounds like uh, kind of as we, as we get going. So we've now added the ability to kind of uh, get some extra articulation for our sounds. And of course, the way that this plays out can vary considerably based on a number of factors. Um, you know, simply by varying the t attack, decay, sustain, and release parameters on the envelope, we can change whether these sounds swell in over time or have this more kind of sudden plucky attack to them. Uh, similarly, we can try using different frequency ranges on the 904A so that the sweep of the cutoff control will have a kind of broader effect and will make the envelopes themselves a bit more dramatic. So I'm going to add one more thing to our patch. I'm going to add some white noise into the CP3 just so we can add a little bit more harmonic g grit for the filter to bite into. Um, and we'll try out that mixed with the oscillators at various levels and kind of change some of the envelope settings over time so you can hear a little bit more of what that's like. Mm -hmm. 
So that gives you a better sense of some of the types of tones and articulations you can create using the 911. Um, that said, typically uh, we'd also use the other 911 to create some articulation at the level of the amplifier itself so that we can kind of separately control the brightness of the sound and its uh, overall dynamic contour over time. So that's another patch idea, but since we're focusing really on the filters for now, let's uh, leave that to the imagination and move onward. The filter can be modulated to great effect by the envelope, but that's by no means the only control source in the system altogether. So let's set up another patch where we use the 921 as an LFO in order to modulate the 904's cutoff frequency. Okay, so this patch is similar to the ones we've just been looking at. So I'm sending two oscillators, the 921Bs through the CP3 and into the 904A low pass filter. And instead of using the envelope to modulate the cutoff frequency, I'm instead using the 921. Now I'm using one of the auxiliary outputs on the 921, uh, which allows us to select a waveform and gives us this variable level control. Now, it's a nerdy detail, but something worth noting is that this output on 921 has a considerably higher potential amplitude than the output of the 921Bs, which makes the 921 in most situations a little bit better as a modulation source because it gives you the ability to dial in a much wider range of modulation. So let's listen to what it's like using the 921 as an LFO to modulate the cutoff frequency. Cool, so you should be hearing this really classic kind of filter modulation effect, this kind of wah, 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 wobble sound. Um, but what's really cool is that in this patch, we don't necessarily have to limit the 921 to exclusively low frequency ranges. In fact, this patch can get super interesting if we push it up into audio rates. Uh, whenever we do that, we'll start to hear a really different type of sound emerge, which we commonly call filter frequency modulation. Uh, basically, by modulating the frequency of the filter um, at rates related to the rates of the oscillators that are running into it, we'll start to hear all these kind of cool, interesting patterns happen. And depending on how you set things, it can get pretty, pretty gnarly sounding.
So I plugged the sequencer into the pitch input on the 921. So we weren't changing the frequency of the oscillators that we're filtering, but changing the frequency of the modulation source. And by doing that, we hear these kind of modulation patterns that change in sync with the sequencer and get us to somewhat more interesting types of dynamic inflections than we can get with the shapes yielded by an envelope alone. Okay, so let's take a look at the 904B's uh, panel controls. So like with the 904A, we have a fixed control voltage knob which controls the cutoff frequency and we have a frequency range switch, uh, this time with only a low and high setting. As you'd expect, we have a signal input and output, and again, like with the 904A, we have three CV inputs, which all affect the cutoff frequency. The 904B has its own really distinct sonic character, and it's really great for creating these kind of uh, fizzy, wispy sort of sounds. So to get a rough idea of what it can sound like, let's try a patch with a couple of saw waves running into to it. In this patch, I'm just using two saws from the 921Bs running through the CP3 mixer and the positive output running into the 904B and that running straight to the output. So we'll do some frequency sweeps and kind of hear how things sound. This really kills the low end entirely and instead gives us this really buzzy, rich, fizzy high end, which coming from the saw waves or the pulse waves from the 921Bs has this really kind of lively, crisp sound to it. Um, that said, uh, you know, sweeping with a knob obviously isn't the only thing we can do. Uh, we can modulate this in the same ways that we were modulating the 904 before. Uh, I'm not going to go through every possible combination of things the way that I did with the 904A, uh, but let's take a listen to what this is like when it's sequenced, and then we'll listen to things with the 921 functioning as an LFO as well. So just. Well, I gradually introduced some modulation from the 921. It started in low frequency ranges, but then gradually shifted the frequency up uh, to be close to a multiple of the frequency of the 921Bs. And by carefully tuning the modulation source and the audio source we were using, we get all these really edgy, kind of distorted timbres um, using, again, a different form of filter FM, where we're modulating a high-pass filter 
rather than a low pass filter. At a glance, it might seem like the feature set of the 904B is uh, a, a little bit weaker maybe than the 904A. After all, we don't have a resonance control on this, and that's one of the things that makes the low pass filter sound so good and so varied. That said, while there isn't really a resonance control built in, that's not to say that we can't create resonance using it. Uh, so I'm going to try another patch quickly where we use some, some clever patching in order to get to a sound that adds some extra resonance. So in this patch, I've added just a couple of extra things. Um, basically, I've used one of the multiples and the mixer to add some of the filter's own output signal back into its own input. So I'm splitting the output. One branch is going to our VCA the way that it has been so far. And then the next is going into our mixer where I have this um, inverting level control so that we can kind of shift the amount of feedback that's introduced into the input. This is how resonance in most filters works. Um, by introducing feedback from the filter's own output to its input, it reinforces the frequencies around the, the cutoff frequency. So you'll start to get this kind of uh, resonant peak or boost uh, at that point. And you'll hear that it really drastically changes the sound of the filter. So I'm gonna start just doing a saw wave sweep uh, without any extra resonance. And then I'll turn the resonance up so you can kind of hear the difference in the raw sound. So once the resonance is added, this really fizzy tone takes on a kind of more nasal and screechy quality uh, just by varying the intensity of the, of the feedback, we're able to kind of hone in on gentler or considerably harsher sounds. So I'm going to add in the modulation sources we were using just a moment ago, the sequencer and this audio rate modulation from the 921 so we can hear what kind of effects you can get when you combine all these techniques together. So uh, even without uh, modulating the oscillators, without providing them any kind of pitch sequence, you'll hear we can get a huge range of different sounds just by clever modulation of uh, something as simple as a high pass filter. All right, so now that we've looked a little bit at the 904A and the 904B, let's look at some ways that they can be combined together using another very special module, the 904C. It's important to note that the 904C filter coupler is not a filter in itself. Uh, it's really just a signal routing utility and a macro control for the other two filters. Uh, so you would never see this module without a 904A and 904B beside it uh, because these are required uh, for it to do its job. So basically what this does is by selecting a mode of operation with this switch, 
routes the filters differently and applies these knobs to their cutoff controls in a very particular way. So this allows us to create both band pass and band reject or notch filter responses and gives us variable control over the band width, uh, which is to say the width of the pass band on a band pass filter or the rejection band on a notch filter. So it's important to note that the controls on the 904C uh, are additive or they combine together with the settings on the 904A and the 904B. Uh, so if you don't have the 904A and 904B set just right, uh, you may find that the effect of the 904C is not super interesting or satisfactory. Uh, that said, we've dialed these into settings that, that sound good to my ears, uh, so uh, we'll be able to start kind of diving into what exactly this module does. So in this patch, I have two square waves coming out of the 921Bs and some noise from the random signal generator going through our mixer and into the input of the 904C. The 904C in turn is then just going directly to this VCA, which is running to our outputs. So let's hear first what the band pass response is like, uh, and then we'll switch to listening to the band reject mode shortly after. So you can hear that uh, this knob again is controlling the center frequency or the kind of uh, middle cutoff frequency of the pass band. And this knob controls the band width, which just adds a spectral separation between the two filters. So whenever you're running in band pass mode, these filters are effectively run in series. So one of the filters kind of shaves off the, the portion of the sound that it's meant to, and then the resultant sound passes into the other one. So by introducing this kind of separation between the two, we're able to get a sort of blooming or opening effect that remains centered around the cutoff frequency defined here. If we switch over to band reject mode, the routing works a little bit differently. So rather than the filters being routed in series, they're routed in parallel. So the sound from the mixer then going to the input is routed to each of these filters, and then the result from each of the filters is summed together. This makes it such that we're, we have the ability to define regions of the sound that are excluded from the output of both filters um, in order to kind of carve out some of the center frequencies. Now at low bandwidths, this will have this kind of notching or phasing-like effect, and at larger bandwidths, it'll carve out more of the sound. So let's listen to some examples of what that sounds like sweeping both the center frequency and bandwidth controls. So you can hear the sound in band reject mode is significantly different than in band pass mode. So when it's set to act as a band pass filter, we get this very narrow range of frequencies that passes through and has a very thin sound. 
uh, whereas in band reject mode, we still get the majority of the full range sound and just have the ability to kind of carve out these little spectral areas. All that said, we should explore this a bit more the way that we've explored the 904A and 904B individually uh, by starting to modulate things. Now, the 904C allows you to modulate both the center frequency and the bandwidth, and both can have really cool effects. So I'm just going to explore a few different options for how things could be modulated. Uh, we're going to start by sequencing our oscillators and uh, using the 921 as an LFO in order to modulate each of these parameters. And then we'll try out some different combinations as we go as well. And we're going to start in band pass mode to hear how, how that sounds. All right, so let's try that same patch now, but rather than using band pass mode, we'll use band reject mode. Um, I'm going to dial back some of the modulation. I'm going to remove the sequencer from the filter so we can get a sense of what the band reject filter sounds like in kind of more normal settings. And I'll gradually introduce the 921 modulating the center frequency so that we can get this band reject sweep. You'll notice that it's somewhat like, uh, like a subtle phasing effect. Um, it has a really, really cool color to it. So let's give that a listen. So the 904C can be used to combine the 904A and 904B uh, in, in a couple of different ways, uh, but it gives you access to a really broad range of sounds that neither of the others can produce by themselves. Sure, you get the really thumpy kind of huge sounding low end in the 904A, and you get this really fizzy, bright, almost uh, twinkly high end from the 904B, but when used together through the 904C, you get everything from these uh, really peculiar sounding phasing effects to very nasal focused uh, edgy sounds in bandpass mode. So like we did with the 904B a few minutes ago, 
Um, there are a lot of sort of uh, extended techniques you can use with the 904C, including the option for feedback. Um, something else worth noting is that the 904A's regeneration control, its resonance knob, uh, remains active when the 904C is doing its thing. So there are a lot of ways that you can vary the sound of this response overall. So let's keep working on this patch we just built. Um, I've just added the option to add feedback through the mixer, though that's turned all the way down at the moment. Um, and yeah, let's get the sequence going again, and we'll hear what it's like once we start to introduce uh, both resonance on the 904A and feedback through, uh, through the CP3. Um, we'll do this in band reject mode at first, and then I'll switch over to band pass mode so we can kind of hear what the differences are. So as you can hear, uh, kind of using this uh, combination of filters in a non-standard way or a way that's not super obvious from the front panel alone uh, can open them up to even a broader range of sounds into these really distorted, uh, wet, and squelchy sort of textures. So as we said before, the 907 fixed filter bank is a bank of 10 filters. There are eight bandpass filters tuned to different frequencies. Uh, one low-pass filter and one high-pass filter, uh, all of which run in parallel. So you send one sound in, it passes through all of these filters separately from one another and then is summed together at the output. Uh, unlike the 904A and 904B, we don't have the ability to modulate the cutoff frequency of any of these filters. Uh, the frequencies are set exactly as they are and that's all you can do. In that way, this is somewhat like a graphic equalizer, though it has a lot more color and is used more for effect generally than for, uh, for utility purposes. 
So probably the most obvious sound uh, to run through to get a sense of the overall character of this filter bank is white noise, which covers the entire frequency spectrum. So we'll be able to hear its effect very clearly uh, at every, every single frequency. So I'm going to kind of freely twist some knobs so you can get an idea of what different combinations of bands can sound like through this filter. So from that alone, you should be able to hear that this, uh, this filter bank is capable of taking very simple sounds and turning them into these really peculiar, like deep sounding soundscapes, uh, almost like something out of a, out of a Lynch movie, right? Uh, it sounds almost like listening to, to something through, through a pipe or um, you know, through the hull of a spaceship. It's a very evocative sound and uh, has been used in a ton of music and, and films in order to, to give you a sense of an otherworldly environment. Uh, of course, uh, noise isn't the only thing we can run through this by a long shot. So for the next patch, let's test what this sounds like with a saw wave oscillator. Uh, we'll start just with a single oscillator and then we'll gradually dial in another so that we can hear what it sounds like uh, in, in a different context. Of course, that sound, while lovely, uh, is very thin and very, very constant. So naturally, you can use this in combination with the other filters as well uh, in order to, to kind of impart some other sonic character on it. So let's try running that same signal uh, through the low pass filter before going to our final output. Thank you. 
as with the other filters, uh, the 907 also can benefit from the use of feedback in order to accentuate certain parts of its sonic character. So while it really doesn't have much other than manual control on the surface, that doesn't mean that we still can't wrench a lot of different sounds out of it. So let's set up a different patch uh, in which we explore what feedback can be like uh, using the fixed filter bank. Okay, so in this patch, I have something similar going on as what we were doing before with feedback with the other filters. Um, just splitting the output, running it back into the CP3, and then running the CP3 into the filter bank's input. Um, I guess a key difference here is that I'm using the, the negative output from the CP3 or the inverted output. Uh, which I found in this situation just gave me a more pleasant ring once I started dialing in some of the different uh, filter intensities. So uh, I'm just running a low frequency saw wave into the input in order to kind of strike or excite the filter or um, ping in, in other terms. And let's listen to, to how that sounds. So you can hear in this patch that as I dial in the feedback on the CP3, the character of the sound changes a lot. It goes from being this kind of uh, dry thud or plop to being something much more glass-like and, and ringing, um, almost like a very crude, uh, physically modeled bowl or, or something of the sort. Um, so exploring feedback in this way can be tremendously interesting, especially if you're able to vary the rhythm of the sound going into it. Um, that said, let's see what this sounds like if our, our ping source is not running in the low frequency range like it is now, but instead is running up in, in audio rate, uh, perhaps with a melody uh, playing through it again. So I'm going to turn up the frequency on these oscillators and get a sequence going again and just see what this sounds like. So you can hear this is not unlike the sound of, of yeah, an oscillator running through a physical resonator. 
Um, key difference being that this is all done with filters and feedback. Um, and naturally, working with feedback, it has the capacity to, to generate some really loud peaks and howls out of nowhere. Um, but using this filter bank for such a purpose yields howls, at least, that have a lot of sonic character. Okay, so this has been quite an exploration, and of course, we've only scratched the surface of what's possible in even a modest sized system like this one. In my experience, Moog's instruments are full of magic, and we could easily go into the same amount of depth exploring the oscillators, controllers, and basically any other aspect of the system. There's a reason that Moog's designs quickly became so ubiquitous and why we still see their influence in basically every electronic instrument out there. And it's not just that he did it first, it's that his instruments found a striking balance between flexibility and performability, with a sound that immediately captures the imagination of whoever's playing them. Despite their modest appearance, these instruments are deeply inspiring, and once you relate the sound and feeling of sweeping this big cutoff knob, for instance, you'll understand how and why these instruments in many ways change the face of music making altogether. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about this instrument, check the link in our video description which will lead you to an article with some extra information and images. For now though, thanks for watching and happy patching.